Hi friends, welcome back to another Home Group Leaders um, Notes on Ephesians. We're up to chapter 3, the second half, which marks a bit of a halfway point through the letter. From here on in, Paul's going to shift to being much more focused on his instruction to this church and to all those reading this letter, to us, what it looks like to live a life shaped by this gospel. But here he pauses to pray. You remember last week he started doing it at the start of the chapter, then uh, got a bit, a bit uh, sort of sidetracked on that um, wonderful sidetrack last time, but now he's back and he shares his prayer. And it's such a rich and deep, wonderful prayer to learn from and to take into ourselves and pray uh, for ourselves as well. Um, I, what I thought I'd do today is something a little bit different. I'm just going to focus in on a few words, uh, a couple of repeated words through this um, through this passage. One thing that's really helpful to do if you're really trying to dig deeply into a passage is particularly pay attention to repeated words. Um, authors will, you know, in uh, the letters especially, but other places as well, will use these repeated words to... Um, and they'll give you a really good idea of the theme, what um, the main idea of a passage is. And this is a good example, this passage of that. And then uh, I wanted to, uh, um, I also wanted to look at a, diff- a third word more in depth and do what's called a word study. Um, and hopefully, I'll, um, hopefully that'll be a really um, enriching and helpful thing for this passage. Um, so the first word I just wanted to uh, particularly focus on uh, is, uh, it comes up uh, in verse 16 here. So Paul introduces in the first couple of verses who he, was, who he prays to, the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. But then verse 16, he starts his prayer and he prays that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power. That's the first of these words. It comes up a number of times through this prayer. And it's an important theme for Paul's prayer, this theme of power. You get it here. uh, You get it as you keep reading um, down in verse 18. He prays that they, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and high and deep is the love of Christ. And then uh, down in the last section, the last couple of verses which... Uh, aren't quite a prayer. They're they're what's often called a doxology. Um, they're um, for yeah. They they function as like a, this high points, this ending to Paul's prayer, and this they show what it is that Paul most desires um, as he finishes his prayer off. And power comes up there again. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power. That is at work within us. To him be glory. So this idea of power is an important one for this prayer. And it would be well worth thinking, how does Paul use this idea of power? Um, What is the effect of this power? What is it that the mighty power of God at work in someone's life looks like? Sometimes we can come to this idea of power with worldly assumptions about power and what it is and what it should look like. What does it look like here in this in this prayer. Uh, the other word that's repeated through, and I'll use red because that's a good colour for this word, uh, the other word is love. Love. And you see that in verse 17 here. Uh, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. They're, they're rooted and established in love. They're already, they've already received the love of God uh, in causing them to be born again and uh, uniting them to to God through Christ and to one another in this new family, but they're all, they're also um, they're, this love is between them as well. This in this new humanity, so they're already rooted and established in love. But he prays that they might have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and that they might know this love that surpasses knowledge, that they might be filled to all the measure of all the fullness of God. So power and love. Having a think of, um, about those two big themes and how they relate to one another, that'll be really helpful for you as you go through. Um, but there's another word that I wanted to particularly focus on, um, just because as I was reading through, th- this word sort of stood out to me and I thought, I'd, I'd like to figure out what a little bit more clearly what it is that Paul's saying here. 
Uh, and that's the word in verse 17 here, the word dwell. I'll make that a bit thicker. There we go. The word dwell. So Paul prays that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It stood out to me as I read it because Paul is writing to Christians. He's writing to people to whom Christ has already come, uh, in whom God's spirit is already living um, these are people, this is this holy temple rising, this dwelling place of God by his spirit. So why does, what's, the, what's going on here? Why does Paul pray that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith? It's obviously not talking about conversion. He's not talking about Christ coming initially into someone's life. There's, something, there's some other thing going on with this language. So uh, what I thought I'd do is go to a number of different places to try and dig a little deeper into this. And I tried to use places that are just commonly available to anyone with an internet connection. Um, so if you are stuck on a word like this and want to chase it up, there's some really great resources online for you. Um, well, the first thing I thought I'd do was uh, look for a bit of a definition uh, from a Bible dictionary. And there's this website, blueletterbible.org. It's a helpful website, a bit technical at times, but um, re some really good stuff on there. And they had this definition uh, of this idea of dwell and or dwellers, dwelling place in the Bible. Uh, and uh, what they've put here is to settle down in a dwelling, to dwell fixedly in a place. That's a bit of sort of old language, but you get the idea. So that helps me think, okay, so Paul isn't talking about conversion here. He's not talking about Christ coming initially. This idea of dwelling has a more a sense of permanence to it. This, he, wants, he wants Christ to come and make his permanent home within their hearts, a, a, a long-term permanent presence in their hearts that transforms them. Uh, over their whole lives. That's, I think that's kind of the sense of it. Another way to get a sense for these things is to just look at the way the word is used throughout the Bible. And that it can be really helpful in enriching your appreciation of what's going on. Um, and it has for me in this passage. Uh, so I did a bit of a word search at this, this website, biblegateway.com, another great website. Uh, it ha is very powerful what it can do in terms of um, you just type in a word and instantly you'll have all the hits in the whole Bible come up of wherever that word occurs. Um, I've used, I used the ESV for that. I mentioned a few weeks ago. That's just a good translation for this kind of study. Um, but I, then, I, then I tried to categorize these different where how this word dwell is used. Um, across, I only looked at the New Testament, and I've pulled out a number. Not all of them. There's there a lot more than this, actually, but uh, a number, a few more. Um, but I uh, pulled out some of the more significant ones that I thought would give us, helpfully, give us a sense for this word across the whole New Testament. Um, there's a few different ways in which it's used. Um, it's used to talk about us and our dwelling, and you get that in this this red these red ones. You get that in Matthew 4 here, where it talks about the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. Those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death. So you, uh, the, you get this picture of humanity outside of Christ. Our, our settled home is darkness and death. Uh, not only that, we don't only dwell in darkness, but darkness dwells in us. Uh, you get that from Romans 7 here, and where he talks about this idea of indwelling sin within us. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Um, and uh, the other one down here from 2 Corinthians I've put is it's talking about us dwelling in the tent of our body. Uh, this um, sense of living in a broken and fallen creation, the way in which that affects our, our bodies themselves, uh, but looking forward to putting on our heavenly dwelling. So you get this picture of us outside of Christ and in this fallen world, dwelling in darkness and sin and death. Um, but then there's this 
um, incredible reversal. The, the, great, the great news of the gospel is that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So we are dwelling in darkness and death, but the word, the light of the world, he has come to dwell among us. He has come into our darkness, into our death, um, uh, in order to draw us out of it by his grace. Uh, so that's the, the green ones here. They're, they're talking about God's dwelling in us or with us. Uh, there's a number, though, um, the yellow ones I've, I've just put there, they talk about the way in which um, the Father dwells in the Son, um, this idea of the mutual indwelling of the persons of the Trinity, one God in three persons who eternally relate to one another in love, who dwell in each other. And you get those from those um, those yellow ones there. But I just wanted to focus on these green ones, though. So the Word becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us. But then, after Jesus has risen, and after at, at the day of Pentecost, he uh, sends his Spirit to dwell in us in this, this um, transforming and rich way. So Christ comes and dwells with us. He sends his Spirit to, the, to then dwell in us. And you get that, that's, that's the Romans one, the Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians, the Spirit dwells in you. He, he talks about the temple idea too, that we talk, looked at it in Ephesians 2, and that's here. Um, we're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians 3, that's our passage. Christ dwelling in our hearts. Uh, it's not as if that's a different thing to the Spirit dwelling. This is that one action of the, the triune God. And Paul can kind of um, sort of shift between the two, um, the Spirit dwelling in, in us, but also Christ dwelling in us. Down in Colossians, you get an interesting um, shift to say the Word of Christ dwelling in us richly. So Christ dwells in us, and as he does that, he, uh, his Word dwells, dwells in us richly, takes its root in our life and transforms us. But um, I wanted to just really point out this last one, though, here. So we've been taken on this incredible journey just by looking at this one word through the New Testament, um, th this picture of humanity dwelling in darkness and death, of the word um, 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 making his home among us, making his dwelling among us, of now through the gospel, God's spirit, um, God by his spirit dwelling within us, but all looking forward to this future reality of... So we, we experience, we taste this dwelling of God within us here and now. And it's real and beautiful and good and true. But it's only a taste, it's only an anticipation of the fullness that awaits us through Christ. And that's what Revelation 21 talks about. He says, uh, uh, the Apostle John, he's a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold... The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. There will be this permanent, eternal, fixed um, dwelling, this um, making a home of God with um, his people. God himself, uh, they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. So what we experience, what we grasp now by God's spirit as he dwells in us, in this way, will be completely and wonderfully fulfilled. Okay, uh, I hope that's, uh, that's helpful. It's certainly enriching to me. I hope to you, um, but also uh, a bit of maybe um, maybe uh, to kind of um, spur you on, inspire you to go and um, do similar sorts of things. If there, if you're in a passage and you're trying to figure something out, there's a word that strikes you. Uh, look for a good look at a good Bible dictionary. You can look online, or perhaps you can buy one. Um, the IVP dictionaries are really helpful for that. Uh, ask me if you want more info. Uh, but you know, do a word search as well, and, and that can just really enrich your sense for what's going on. It, it helps me to know that what's, there's something really significant going on here in chapter 317 when Paul prays that uh, his desire is that Christ might dwell in their hearts through faith. Um, that's a, a loaded term with richness to it. Uh, that sort of uh, yeah brings this to life for me. Okay, got a few quotes there from John Stott. I'd really encourage you to set aside time to read them. I've also got a couple of quotes from Don Carson. Uh, I mentioned his book a couple of weeks ago, Praying with Paul, going through the letters, of, the prayers of Paul. 
the first quote here uh, talks about this idea of um, Christ coming to live within us, and he uses the image of our house renovation. is very powerful. Um, but this last one here, I'd really encourage you to meditate on this last quote. He, he takes on the last couple of verses, this doxology of this prayer, and he shows the way in which that um, is, that's Paul's great desire, and it ought to shape us how we pray too. The ultimate purpose of Paul's prayer is that there be glory to God in the church and in Christ Jesus. And here we go. This sentence sort of made me, made me pause for thought here. Uh, it is possible to ask for good things for bad reasons. We may desire the power of God to operate in our lives so that we may become more holy. We may ask for power to grasp the limitless dimensions of the love of God and yet distort these good requests by envisaging their fulfilment within a framework in which the entire universe revolves around our improvement. Okay, that's, that's a long sentence, basically saying we can pray for these good things, but basically from a, a self-centered perspective where our, our main goal is improving ourselves, And, you know, God's, a, God's sort of there to as a bit of a help to us, a self-help guide to improving ourselves. And we can pray these things with a self-focus. Um, but uh, Carson's really helping us to see, well, the way Paul ends this prayer is um, a rebuke to that way of praying, that way of thinking. And he says, here then is how we shall reform our praying. We shall learn to pray with the apostle, not only in his petitions, what he asks, but also in his words of praise, in his ultimate goal, in his profound God-centeredness. So that's uh, what, how we should be praying to, and um, I pray that that will be a real encouragement to us as we gather around this text uh, from Ephesians this week. So let me, uh, let me pray for us as we finish up. Our God, thank you for this wonderful prayer of the Apostle. We thank you, Lord, for the riches that are there. We thank you. We praise you for your glorious riches, and we pray that out of them you might strengthen us with power. Help us to know this love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Help us to grasp it in whatever ways that we can. Uh, and Lord, uh, we know that, that you are able to do more than we could even ask or imagine. And so we pray this for your glory, that, there might, that you might be glorified in our church, that as we gather together and are established in love, and as we together grasp your love for us, that you might be glorified throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.